church let's stand let's sing that old song standing on the solid rock through my disappointments strife and discontentment i cast my every care on the lord no matter what obsession pain or deep depression i'm standing on the solid Good morning, church. So glad you all are here today. And, and uh, you know, and let's just put our minds and our hearts on worshiping God this day as we look into his scripture. And read with me Psalms 119, verses 1 and 2. Joy are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. Oh, so much truth in those two little verses of scriptures. And you're here today because you follow the Lord. You want to know his instructions and you want to obey his laws. And you're going to search for him with all of your heart. And so thank you for being here today and joining us even on Facebook Live. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, please say something. We'd love to know who's watching and where you're from as well. And so thank you for being here today. I'm going to ask if you would be seated just for a moment. Miss Claudia, come on up here. Yes, this is, this is a special time here in our church. And that is that April is two things. One, it's, it's Professional Administrative Appreciation Day, which was uh, last Wednesday, but it's also the anniversary of Claudia Strutton. She has been faithfully serving the Lord here at Bethel Baptist Church for 48 years. Amen. <laughs> And as you can tell, she started here when she was two years old. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell people all the time, whenever they call, do you want to talk to the man in charge or the woman that knows what's going on? <laughs> and she is such a blessing to me and to our church. And so, Miss Claudia, we wanted to give you a little something. And that is, here's a card, and it's got some little things inside of it just for you. And then also the beautiful yellow flowers there. Uh, if you want to pick those up after church, you can so that you don't have to take them back there. Jim will take them out to the car for you. I, I'm also going to tell you something else about, about Claudia. This last week, uh, Claudia was involved in a very serious automobile accident. Uh, and it was not her fault. A gentleman ran the red light up here at Sulphur Springs Road in Hunts Bridge and, uh, and just totaled her car. And so uh, she called me. I was the first one you called, wasn't I? Yeah, she called me and she says, Daniel, I've been involved in an accident. And I said, where are you? And she told me and I said, are you okay? And she said, yes. And when I got there and I saw the front end of her car and she was still sitting in it, uh, only I could do was just say, thank you, Jesus. 
And so I am so thankful the Lord spared you because <laughs> Lord knows I still need you. <laughs> and so, and this church does too. But, but uh, I'm going to... By the grace of God that I'm here today. Oh, yes, only by the grace of God she's here today. And, and uh, what a blessing that she is. She is one of those that does so much behind the scenes that no one never really knows about. Even I don't even know what all she does. I'm just thankful she does payroll on time. And she keeps up with so much stuff around this church. And she is a walking encyclopedia as far as people goes. I'm all the time asking her, Claudia, do you know so-and-so? And she'll think for a moment. And she can rattle off, yeah, now that's so-and-so. And this is this. And that was that one and everything. I think someday she might struggle remembering her own name. But she remembers church members, though, I tell you. <laughs> but I just want to offer up a prayer and just thank the Lord for you, Miss Claudia. And, and let's just pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for Claudia. God, for what she means to me, Lord, to this church. Father, continue, Lord, to bless her with health and strength, God, to be able to best serve you. Lord, everything in which she does, God, we know she brings glory and honor to you. Thank you, God, for how that you protected her this last week, Father, in that accident. And uh, God, we just thank you now, Lord, for our church. And Lord, as we continue this service, Lord, may you be glorified. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you, Miss Claudia. Let's give her a hand this morning. And the, uh, Randy, come on up, brother, and ask God's blessings upon this service today. No, dear, I'm not <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Claudia told me, she said, now Jim had to get off of that hip pocket and get her a new car. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you here today. What a wonderful day God's given us. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for this time and the service that we can come to you just thanking you and everything that you do. Lord, be with Daniel as he brings our message today and just speak to him and let him speak to us, Lord. Be with Michael as he leads the singing. Give us all a good, safe day today. God, we love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Stand and worship this morning with us. Heaven's mercy 
rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder.
who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? The sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the land the land. Oh, every knee will bow before him. This morning as I was uh, just walking around greeting some of the folks, Miss Beth shared a story with me about her granddaughter, Nova Lee. And, uh, and, and, I, and I was thinking about it and I said, wow, that'll fit into the sermon, but you know, I want to share it with you all as part of the prayer time. On Easter Sunday morning, Nova Lee, instead of going to children's church, she wanted to stay in the sanctuary. And she was listening. Sometimes we don't realize what children are actually listening to and what they're absorbing and what they're comprehending. And that's why we just keep putting the seeds and keep watering them and just letting God give the increase. And you know, and that's also one of the reasons why it's so important that we focus on children's ministry here in our church. And I'm so thankful for, for ones like Jeremy and Misty who work so diligently with our children and the plans in which they make. And I know we've got Vacation Bible School coming up, our next big event, and, and the Wednesday night Bible Club, and that'll be coming to, a, to an end for the summer just in a few weeks, and a lot of information about that in the beacon. But you know, Nova Lee said something that, that Easter Sunday morning. She says, so Jesus isn't in the grave, you know, down here, isn't that how, something like that? And she said, no, it says, he's alive. And Nova Lee says, then I want to go talk to him. I got some things I want to say. <laughs> you know, out of the mouth of babes, and that grandmother was able to explain, Jesus is alive. He's in your heart. You know, and for us as adults, sometimes we get so focused on ourselves that we forget to look around and realize Jesus is alive. And Jesus is around us, and he's in us. But do we recognize him? We serve a risen Savior. God is alive and very well, church. And we are his children. And there's never a day, never a moment, that we do not need to acknowledge him and to know that he is here with us. And one of the best ways to ever do that is actually just through prayer. Prayer is us talking to a living God. Prayer is, is, is us communication with, with someone that loves us, Jesus. And whenever we spend time in prayer with him, then the more alive he becomes to us, we become more aware of him. And so when I encourage you to pray on Sunday mornings, this isn't a time just for you to bow your head, close your eyes, and zone out and wait till I get through praying. It's a time for you just to move into the presence of God. And recognize that he is alive. He is that worthy lamb that brings us our salvation. Let's talk to him this morning. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, how good it is to know that you are alive. And that, Father, that you invite us to come and be alive in you. And so, Father, this day we come, Lord, with our, with our voices of praise to you. 
God, for just who you are. God, sometimes we get so caught up on just thanking you, Lord, for our food and thanking you for this day, thanking you for our health and our strength, thanking you, Lord, for the blessings of money and, and other possessions and friends and family. But God, right now, we just want to focus on thanking you for who you are, the God who loved us so much that you gave us your only begotten son, Jesus. God, the one that, through your love, showed us love. Lord, through your grace, you invited us to be able to come and to be able to be a part of your family and to be able to know you. Father, through your wisdom and knowledge, God, we come, Lord, leaning not into ours, but, Lord, into yours to guide us and lead us and direct us, Father, in the paths in which we should take. So, God, this day, we just want to just praise you for who you are and thank you that our Savior lives. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's sing the old rugged cross. You may remain seated as we sing. Bless you. will follow me 
all the days of my life. Would you stand as we sing, surely goodness and mercy.
I invite you to take your Bibles and turn back with me to the book of Luke in the 24th chapter, where we were last week as I continue this little mini-series about the road to Emmaus. And as we have uh, been wanting to discover about what God did on this little walk, I know that it is uh, certainly something for us to consider about our walk with the Lord. And uh, I titled this series Undercover Boss. And uh, just to remind you that, you know, like the TV show, you know, the boss, either the CEO or the president or the owner of a corporation, will have a disguise on and go and appear at work as just a common worker among all the other people. And uh, they don't realize until the end of the show the revealing whenever they realize who they've been dealing with the whole time. And this is what has happened here on this road to Emmaus with a couple of disciples as they are walking from Jerusalem. You see, Passover has come and it has ended. And also the crucifixion of Jesus has taken place. And there's nothing else to keep them there in Jerusalem. So they're heading back a seven-mile journey Take them a couple of hours or more to go back to Emmaus whenever they're on their walk and all of a sudden Jesus appears to them. But they didn't recognize him. They did not realize that it was him. And last week we looked at part one and about how that we looked about the resurrection and how that God had opened the grave. And today we're going to look at part two and that is God opening the scriptures. It's important that we know that God is the one that opened the grave. And now it's important for us to open the scriptures. And so as we have done so today in Luke chapter 24, let me pray. Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your precious word. God, that you have written and given to us. That, Father, that we can have faith and trust in you through it. Father, because we believe that it is real. Lord, we know that it is without error, and that, God, that you have divinely inspired it, Lord, that we might be able to learn from it and know these truths. And so, Father, in this moment, God, will you open our eyes, and, Lord, teach us your word. And, Father, use me as the preacher right now. But, Father, let the people hear your Holy Spirit much louder and much clearer than me. 
And so, Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us your word and giving us this story. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Verse 13 begins, it says, The same day two of Jesus' followers were walking in the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked alone, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. When he had hoped, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen an angel who had told them, Jesus is alive. Some of the men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures to things concerning himself. Now I want us to stop right there. And let us bear in mind that these men were followers of Jesus before his crucifixion. They may have not been up close to him as what the 12 apostles were, but yet they were close enough in his followings that they believed in Jesus because they had hope in him. And that was that they had had this hope that Jesus was going to be the rescuer of Israel. And they had this self-imposed, grandiose ideal of what this man was going to do and how he was going to act and what he was going to look like and all the things he was going to do. You see, and sometimes what the problem is is instead of us getting to know the real Jesus, we want to only know the Jesus in which we create in our own minds. You see, there are plenty that will stand in pulpits all around the world and preach a false gospel, particularly a prosperity gospel. Have I ever told y'all how I feel about that? <laughs> and they'll tell you all these things that, oh, if you'll only believe, if you'll only have faith, and boy, you know, God's going to make you rich, you know, and, and, and if you don't have this and if you don't have that, it's because you don't have enough faith. And so therefore, if you'll send in some faith seed money to my ministry and help me become richer, then God will do all these other things unto you. And people just swarm to that kind of stuff. Why? Because we live in a day and age where people want to have their ears tickled instead of knowing the gospel, knowing actually what the word of God has to say. Now, I want to share something very bold with you all. And that is, I appreciate your confidence in me as being your pastor and being your preacher. That when I stand before you with this precious word opened up, I want to always, with all of my heart, rightly divide the word of truth. But don't put blind faith in me. You see, I don't want you to become a follower of me. I want you to become a follower of Jesus. My job is to present the truth to you. Your job is to discover the truth and then to live by it as I so desire to live in my own heart, in my own life. Now, here's what we must take from that. 
And that is that just because I say it, just because I preach it, I appreciate your confidence, but I want you to know it from your own faith, of your own study, from your own Bible. Because see, this is where a lot of churches do not encourage people to ever bring their Bibles to church. They never encourage the people to ever read the scriptures during the week for themselves. And certainly not to study it. Why? Because the pastor is not a man of God. He is a cult leader. And he wants to have the control over the people. You can go to churches even right here, not too far from us, where everything and everything is taught except for really the scriptures. Oh, they might have a Bible in there. And a man may stand up before them and he may read maybe a little feel-good passage of scripture. And then he's never going to preach about sin or about your responsibilities of a sinner coming to know a Savior named Jesus, nor for you to ever actually follow the real Jesus. Folks, those aren't churches, they're country clubs. They're not pastors, they're chaplains. And at worst, they're actually cults with a cult leader. And folks, I want to tell you, my job is to present the word and present the real Jesus to you. But it's your responsibility to start following him. Don't follow Daniel Lee, because I've stepped in something and y'all don't want to go where I've been. I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to, I want you to be able to see me following Jesus but I don't want you to come behind me. I want you to come beside me. Because why? I believe in the priesthood of believers, which means I have no more right to God than what you do. You do not get God only through me. You get God through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one that will bring us truth from God's word. And this is why even Jesus himself was blinded to these men because they were not ready to receive the truth. And it wasn't until after they sat through a Bible lesson did God ever really reveal who Jesus was to them. Now I wanna share something with you. I personally get very sick of hearing people say, oh, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I get sick of hearing people say that. People who used to go to church regularly and saw the importance of it, who don't go anymore, and you tell them, so hey, we'd love to have you back, and they, oh, well, you don't have to really go to church to be a Christian. And then you know what the response to that is? You're right, but a real Christian will want to go to church. So now tell me about your relationship with Christ. Why, because most of the time, and I'm going to say the overwhelming majority of the time, I'm going to say 99.9999% of the time, people who never attend church never open up their Bibles during the week. Or if they do, they're only searching for what they already want to hear or what they want to try to prove themselves in their own thinking. So I just want to encourage you, church, Understand the reason and the purpose of going to church. It's not a social club, though we do have fellowship called Konania. It's not a place to be seen, but yet I can promise you this, when you're absent, you are missed. You know, we went a year with COVID stuff going on, and I know we're still in it, but yet, you know, y'all you know, are getting vaccinated, a lot of people's got it, you've gotten over it, you know, and, and I realize the seriousness of it, but you know, if you can still go to Walmart, you can come to church. There, I said it. And I look around here and I see pews that are empty where I know that there's families. And I know where people sit. Why? Because y'all are creatures of habit and y'all have named your pew, you know. And, and good Lord, you know. Even though, Lib, you are over there on that side, most of the time you're sitting over here somewhere or another, you know. And it's so good to see you and Lori back here. But you know, I, I see that, and, and, and I want to tell you right now that when I see families that are not here, and it becomes a habit they're not here, 
hang on here. It's the man's fault. There, I said it. It's the man's fault. You know why? Because the scripture tells us the man is to be the spiritual leader of the home. Men, it is your job to get up on Sunday mornings and get your family up and to be able to get them here to church. Shame on you if you depend on your wife or the mother of the children to do that. It's the man's job. So can I encourage you men, and if you're watching by Facebook, between now and next Sunday, grow a backbone and say, as far as me and my house goes, we will serve the Lord. And the way in which you serve him is not just being in attendance in church, it's coming to church so that you can sit under the teaching of the word of God and from that realize who the real Jesus is and from the real Jesus, it make a difference in your heart and in your life. And if not, then what you're doing is going around blinded to who Jesus really is. So is church important? Yes. Yeah, so is also reading your own Bible. I'm thankful that every day, Monday through Friday, 32 men, most of them here from our church, I send a text to with a verse of scripture in it. Any of you men, if you want in on this text message, just let me know. I'll be glad to add you to the list. But 32 men, and for this last year or more, we've been going through the book of Proverbs. And just one text a day. And it's amazing to me how many times that men have, have sent me back and saying, wow. Or saying, you know, I didn't realize that was in the Bible. Or saying, ouch. Because it's true. And so men, let's be like these men that were on the road to Emmaus. They were just simply just leaving a very traumatic experience in their life and going back home. They had seen this man named Jesus being crucified and saw him die. They saw him put into a grave. They had heard the report, but it did not resonate with them. They heard that the women had gone and had seen an angel and had heard that he had been raised from the dead. They had heard that other men had gone and testified that he is alive, but yet they themselves had not really let it sink into their hearts. Listen to me, men. That is so much like us today. We just got through celebrating Easter, and this is why I'm still preaching Easter, because it wasn't that long ago. And that's why we even come together every Sunday on, you know, for church on Sunday, is because we celebrate Easter every, every week on Sunday, the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and they heard the report, but it not really sunk into their hearts. And instead, they were walking away disappointed that the, that the Jesus they created in their mind did not do what they thought they, that he should have done. Listen to me. When people don't do what you think they ought to do, they'll disappoint you every time. When Jesus does not do what you think he ought to do, he'll disappoint you. Better yet, instead of you just thinking about what Jesus ought to do, why don't you know what Jesus did? And this is the scripture. And you know what made a difference in these men's life? Right here. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I want to tell you, this passage of scripture right here was a turning point in my ministry. This is where I moved away from preaching only topical sermons to begin preaching more and more exegetical sermons where I want to take verse by verse and I want to take it apart and I want to devour each one of those little words and I want to hear what God has got to say to me. And that's what I want to bring to you all because topical sermons, I can preach on any topic and make the Bible say anything that I want it to say. But whenever you start with the scriptures, you've got to preach what's right there in the scriptures and you've got to take it for what it meant then and what it means today. And if it means something today, then what it meant back then is the false gospel. And so this was a challenge to me. And so I could not help but to think, what did Jesus actually say? And the scripture is silent right here. And, and we know also that this right here was recorded by Luke. Most probably that Cleopas, the one that was already been mentioned here, and the other man is totally silent. Um, 
He is the one that actually gave Luke this story probably 30 years after Jesus' resurrection that then Luke, through the Holy Spirit, put it into the scriptures for us to have today. And Luke is the only one that recorded this. And what he did not record for us is exactly what was Jesus' teachings. But it does say that he went through the writings of Moses. Now, that means that he went through the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. You know what they are? Church, say it with me. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Hey, good job. You remember some of your Sunday school passage, you know, from, from that. Sometimes it's good for us to remember that. I used to know it. I even said it in front of church. But the older I got, the more then I had to study scriptures by categories and by authors and everything, I even get confused. That's why I believe that that table of contents that's in the front of your Bible that tells you what page number is on, it is just as inspired as the rest of the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Hey, if you got one of those Bibles that's got the tabs already cut out to let you know where to flip to, <laughs> you buy them if you need them. Get them. And know something about the Bible. So we got the teachings of Moses and all the prophets. Now let me tell you, this was not a 15-minute devotion or a 30-minute sermon or an hour-long church service. This happened later in the day, and they were there for a while. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. But preacher, you ain't Jesus, so don't keep us here that long. So I won't. But I do want to cause you to think today. Did Jesus maybe go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? And teach them where it says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman. This is talking to the serpent after the fall of Adam and Eve. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and he will strike his heel. What was Jesus explaining to them? That from the scriptures, that when Adam and Eve sinned, and God came to them in the cool of the evening, and brought them out from their hiding, even in their nakedness, and they were ashamed, and they had covered themselves with fig leaves. And, and, and there they heard God ask what happened, like he did not already know what happened. And, of course, Adam passed the blame. It was this woman's fault that you gave to me, wimp. And the woman says, well, uh, it's the serpent's fault. The serpent is the one that came and tempted me. And God says, you're all guilty. And man, upon you, I'm going to make it hard to make a living and to be able to grow crops. And woman, I'm going to make it difficult for you to be able to bear children. And you're going to have to live outside of my paradise here in this garden. I know, and serpent, uh, no legs, you're going to slither on the ground. And then he gives this prophecy. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And there we see the beginning of Jesus being foretold. Now, I'm quite sure because he was the undercover boss, he did not say, and I have just struck the head of Satan. He was probably saying, and didn't you know that Jesus just struck the head of Satan Whenever he died on the cross and think, and Satan thought that he had control now and had victory, but now he's alive. Did he take him maybe to Genesis 22? And all the Jews know Abraham and know the story about Abraham and his son named Isaac and how that they were told to go and to Abraham was to sacrifice his son Isaac up on Mount Moriah. And he says, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Did, did Jesus take them through the story about how that Abraham had this one son named Isaac and whom he loved. Hey, listen to me, church. You want me to tell you something? Do you realize that this is the first mention of love in the Bible? It was between a father and a son and whom the son was going to be a sacrifice? Did Jesus maybe take them through from there to John 3, 16 and say, you know, and... And, 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 as, and as Nicodemus heard Jesus say, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then maybe Jesus might even told them, says, you know what? That same mountain Moriah where Abraham took Isaac, but in the last moment he provided another sacrifice, a lamb that was caught in the thicket. And God says, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, yes, here am I. He says, do not touch that son. Do not touch that boy. For I provided the sacrifice. Did Jesus teach them that on this same mountain was where he was crucified? But this time, there was no other substitution. It had to be the blood of a spotless lamb that would die for our sins. Did Jesus take them through that lesson? Did Jesus maybe then take them over to Exodus chapter 12 and remind them from whence they had come out of the bondage in Egypt and how they were let go Because of a man named Moses that God was using to go to Pharaoh and tell him, Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh kept his hard heart and would not let him go. And so God began to bring the plagues upon them. And he did so so that God might be able to show his power. And then it was during that time that he gives the instructions to the children of Israel. He says, to take a, a lamb or a, a young goat and to sacrifice it and to, and, to, and to take its blood and to sprinkle it around the doorpost of your home. And then you were to consume that, that, that animal and, and then also eat the bread. And the next morning, when the death angel visits, it will pass over those homes that have been marked by the blood. Did Jesus take them back into that and say, but the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you stay. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Did Jesus take them into a lesson of saying, but but my blood, but he was not saying my blood. He says, you know, the blood of Jesus is like that that of that lamb that was sacrificed, that was then placed over the doors of the children of Israel, so that when the death angel came, it would pass over them, and whom we've just got through celebrating this particular event. And he explained it to them that through the blood of Jesus being applied to our hearts, though we might die physically on this old earth, we will live in eternity forever. Did he explain that to them? Did he maybe even go into Numbers chapter 21? Where while the children of Israel were whining and complaining about how that Moses, why did you take us out of Egypt? You know, we had a good back there compared to what we're having out here. You know, and we were in bondage and we were in slavery and it was tough, you know, and we were having to make bricks without straw and, and, and we were oppressed and we could not worship God, our maker, like we should. But hey, at least we knew what was going on here. We don't know what's happening. And so they were whining. I want to say at this point, Moses probably wanted to break out the crackers and cheese, but we're a Baptist church, so I'm not going to go there. (laughs) But instead, because of their whining, God sent poisonous snakes into the midst. Say, God did that? Yeah, he wanted to show them. Look, it can get a whole lot worse. But just as what this will happen, I will also show you healing. So he instructed Moses. He says, then, he, then the Lord told Moses, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by the snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Did Jesus go back into this and explain to them what he had already said from John 3 when he says, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus said, you know what, but Jesus had, you know, 
That man, Jesus, had to be lifted up high above the earth on a cross. And all those who look upon him shall be healed and have eternal life. They sat there in amazement. Did, did, did he go through Psalms chapter 2, Psalms chapter 16, and Psalms chapter 22? Did he go through all of those particular prophecies as well? Did he get over to Isaiah chapter 7? Where it says, therefore the Lord himself will be given, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. When do we most often hear that passage of scripture? Christmas, exactly. Did Jesus give them this lesson? And saying, but wait a moment. You know, he said he'd give you a sign. This man, Jesus, that was just crucified, who now you've heard was raised from the dead, he had to be born of a virgin. And his name should be called Emmanuel, which means, anybody know? God with us. Did he maybe take him over to another Christmas passage? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hmm. Did he take them there? Let me tell you, they were there for a while. And the scripture says he took them through the teachings of Moses, and I've only just hit just the skim of the surface. And he went through all these old prophecies. And do you realize that in the Bible there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus' coming? 300. Do you realize that over a quarter of your entire Bible is prophecy? Over 28% of the entire Bible is prophecy. You know, and this is where people want to feel like that they've got an option to either take Jesus or leave Jesus. And you know what? You have it. But the more you study the scriptures, the more you'll realize this is Jesus. Not because of what I say, but because of what the Word of God has to say. Now, let's just take out of those 300, let's just take 10 of these prophecies. Let's just take 3% of all the prophecies in the Bible, and let's just talk about them just for a moment. You see, the scripture says that he will be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, born to the tribe of Judah, begin his ministry in Galilee, enter Jerusalem on a donkey, sold for 30 pieces of silver, crucified through hands and feet, crucified between thieves, no bones should be, be broken, and his side will be pierced. Now that's just 10, but there's 300 of them. Let me give this to you in a, another way. <clears throat> Imagine with me, if you would, in a vast region of the world, you have, you have skilled archers. Okay, people that can shoot bows and arrows, if you're not sure what a skilled archer is. And you have these 300 skilled archers that are in different locations who can take an arrow out of their quiver, load their bow, and pull it back and shoot it up into the air. And the arrow make its trajectory and land in the bullseye on a target. 300 of them, not in the same region and not even living at the same time. Does that kind of shake your brain a little bit? This was the prophecies that were given. And church, let me give you some hope here. Every single one of the over 300 were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, there were lots of baby boys that were born in Bethlehem. You say, well, what about this one over here? <laughs> Was his mama a virgin? Hmm. Well, there's lots of baby boys that were born in the tribe of Judah, but how many of them were born in Bethlehem that was born of a virgin? 
you know, that virgin part is really important, you know. Some people say, well, it's not really that important. Yes, it is, because if Jesus was not born of a virgin, he's not really our Messiah. But I can tell you that all these things were done according to the prophecies of Scripture. Let, let me also just give you a, a, another thought about this. And that is that, that I heard a, a pastor by the name of Skip Heisig use this illustration, and I'm just going to borrow his illustration. And that is, uh, imagine that I had 10 coins in my pocket. And on those 10 coins, I had written 1 through 10 on, on all 10 of them. Y'all with me on this? One on one, two on another. Okay. And I reach inside my pocket and I pull out a coin and I want to pull out the first coin. And when I do so, you do realize that for me to pull out the first coin, number one, is an odds of one in 10. Okay. All right. Now, if I were to take that, 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 that same coin, put it back in my pocket and then say, okay, I'm going to pull out and I'll shake it all up and I'm going to reach inside my pocket and I'm going to pull out coin number one and then coin number two out of the 10 in that order. My odds have now gone to one and 100. It greatly intensifies the odds. But now if I'm going to then pull out these coins all 10 of them in the sequential order all at one time without having to put any back in my pocket, then my odds then of pulling all 10 of those coins out then goes to one in 10 billion. That's just one out of 10. 300? Think about this man named Jesus. There was a, a man who wrote a book many years ago. He was a mathematics professor by the name of, of Peter Stoner. And when I heard this, it, uh, it, it really <laughs> perked my interest because y'all know that most of my background, my undergraduate degree was in mechanical engineering. In, in high school and in college, I could, I, I could work math in my brain. I could work a polynomial without paper. Um, but give me a sentence to diagram, I could totally slaughter it. That's why I tell y'all I'm amazed that God called me to be a preacher. Because English was my most bestest subject. <laughs> give me math, give me science. But here I is. Thank y'all for tolerating my slaughter of the English language. But nonetheless, I found this immensely fascinating. He says, out of the 300, let's just take 48 of them. Just 48 of the prophecies. And, and, and he, he shares this, and Peter Stoner, this, this mathematician, he says, to begin with, let's just take eight of the prophecies and of the chances that all eight of them would be fulfilled by one person. It would actually be one to ten, one out of 10 to the 17th power. Now, <clears throat> some of you are thinking back, hey, I remember powers back whenever I was in school and having to learn them, but I don't remember anything about them, okay? Let me just kind of explain it to you like this. And this is just taking just eight out of the 300, okay? Just eight of them. Peter Stoner says, if you take a silver dollar, Okay, y'all have seen silver dollars, you know, a little bigger than a quarter, a little less than a 50 cent piece, you know. Well, about the same size, Randy, right? About the same size as a 50 cent piece. A little bigger than a 50 cent piece, all right. See, I'm so broke, I don't do, deal with quarters and pennies. Y'all deal with the silver dollars and everything. You take a silver dollar and you put a mark on it. Y'all with me? You, you take that silver dollar and you take enough of them that you would make something that would be two feet thick with that silver dollar somewhere in those two feet. That's about two feet right there, ain't it? Okay. 
Stay with me on this. Then you take that silver dollar that is hidden inside of that two feet thickness and you take enough of them that you can cover the entire state of Texas. You with me? I'm shaking your brains this morning. So you've got the entire state of Texas and they're just a little bit bigger than South Kakalaki, okay? And it's two feet thick in silver dollars. And out of all of those silver dollars, there's only one that has the mark on it. Then you tell a man, go find that coin. Oh, by the way, <laughs> blindfolding. That is the probability of this man named Jesus fulfilling all 300 prophecies about his life, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ministry that has been given to us. <laughs> yes, it takes a lot of faith to believe in Jesus. But the Bible proves it all true. And see, and whenever we open the scriptures and we discover this man named Jesus, not because of what the preacher had to say, but because what the scriptures have revealed to you. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Five things. I want you to hold up your five fingers, okay? Hold them up right here at me. All right? Don't matter right hand, left hand. You can even do both hands. I don't care. All right, hold them up. I want you to look at them, okay? Number one, whenever you read the scriptures... It's going to reveal who God is. That's number one, okay? That is number one. Remember, your number one finger is you're reading the scripture who is to discover who God is. Number two, what Jesus has done. And you've noticed that the number one finger is always going to be number one. That's uno. That's the alpha. That's God. But just as Jesus had to be high and lifted up, so we must lift up Jesus in our hearts and lives. And this finger is taller than the rest of them. So go and looking in the scriptures to discover who God is, what Jesus has done. Then that third finger, your ring finger, discover who I am. And notice it's close to Jesus. And that is where you want to be in the scriptures is, is discover first off who God is. Discover what Jesus has done. People want to say, WWJD. Well, tell me what Jesus did. It's in the scriptures. But then look to discover who I am. And it got to be close to Jesus in order to discover that. Number four, what about other people? We need to, to, to read the scriptures to first off discover who God is, what Jesus has done, who I am, and then discover about other people. Instead of people always trying to take the scriptures to try to be able to point out a splinter in somebody else's eye. Start with the first three. And then here's number five. What God's will is for my life. And as Fonzie would say, hey. <laughs> I love this old crowd. Y'all know who I'm talking about. You kids today don't have no clue. Hey, it's kind of a universal sin, isn't it? See, sometimes we jump into the scriptures wanting to do one of these other things, but we don't get them in this order. We, we, we want to find out what God is will for my life, but you don't want to discover who really Jesus is. You want to find out about other people, but you don't want to discover who you are. You, you want to discover only what Jesus did, but you want to put it apart from what God is and what he can do for you. I'm telling you, folks, if you'll take just this little simple little five steps and remember them by your fingers. And by the way, I didn't get this out of a book. God gave this to me. Who God is, what Jesus has done, who I am, what about other people, what God's will is for my life. I've written that out in, in, in one of my journals to where when I'm reading the scriptures, I go through that little checklist right there. What I learned about God, myself, others, and, what, and, and, and about what God's will is for my life. That way you're not just reading it to be reading it like a textbook. And this is where these men are on this journey. And what you'll discover whenever you get into this word is that if a man can live up to 300 predictions, then that man's worth following. 
And that man is worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration. Now listen to me. He's also capable of being the master of your life. If he can get all that other right, he can help you get your life right. First off with God, by accepting his salvation that he provided for us through the shedding of his blood. You say, well, yeah, I'm saved, but is he really the master of your life? You'll know that he's the master whenever you're in his word discovering who he is daily. Not just trusting what the preacher's going to say on Sunday morning. Yeah, this book is just that important. And what we need to do is realize that sin will keep us from this book. And we need to ask for his forgiveness. And let him make us whiter than snow. So as Michael comes and leads us in this song, this altar is open. I'm here to pray with you. But come now, come quickly as we let Jesus be the Lord of our lives. Let's stand together. so much for being here today and I, and I want to encourage you in, in closing you know you say well okay pastor I, I want to be in the word all right first off make sure you want a copy of the word and if you don't have a Bible if you'll let me know we'll help you get one and if you can't afford one we'll buy it for you and I can also make a lot of recommendations for a lot of great study devotional Bibles as well and then where do you begin I always love telling people to start in the book of John just read the book of John and then just kind of read through the Gospels, then back up to Matthew and read through those, you know, through those. And then the Old Testament, I always tell them, read the book of Psalms and, and the book of Proverbs. And, and then as you, as, as you begin to develop that appetite for it and, that, and that, that habit of it, then we'll get into more, you know, deeper things. But one of the greatest things is just being here on Sunday mornings. And, and being a part of a life group and studying the Bible together with a group of believers. And man, like I've said, I offer to you the, the text message every day. It's just a passage of scripture. I don't give you devotion. I just send you the word and let the word deal with you because it's dealing with me. And so um, be in the word. And by the way, there are some great apps on your phone that you can get on your tablet, on your computer. Uh, Uversion is my favorite. And, uh, and so... Uh, Find yourself one of those apps and find yourself there in the Word. But let, it, let God reveal to, him, reveal to you who He is through His precious Word. Thank you for being here. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Let's go out of here with a benediction on our hearts. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. and so be it. <laughs>